Can you see me? Yep, we can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Enough of this funny stuff. Okay. <laughs> Let's get serious. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now we're going to have a hard time getting serious. Yeah. Well, in, in the early weeks of 2021, you two launched a groundbreaking exploration <laughs> of gender and you've been pumping out content since then. It, was I correct? It was like January or February of 2021? I think it was December. I think. Was it December, Sasha? I, that sounds about right. I, I'll believe yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. I think it, I, rem December. I remember, I think we inadvertently started very quickly because of a, a kind of almost a mistaken conversation where I said to Sasha, yeah, let's do it. And Sasha kind of had us, <laughs> a, a silent freak out going, really? This soon? And suddenly we were gone ahead. So we we yeah. started accidentally. <laughs> Is that and right? I think so. I, I can't. I really have a problem with my memory these days. So like if you suggest it and it sounds plausible, I'll just agree. So <laughs> don't don't listen to me. I, I think that's right. <laughs> I, I do, I do remember again. there was a thing about New Year's and I remember yeah. thinking, Oh, people will catch up in the new year. I do remember there being something around the new year that caught our attention. Yeah. yeah. And then I interviewed you and you guys yeah. launched it really soon after that. So I can't remember the date too. I'm bad with these date things. But anyways, mm -hmm. my point is, is that you guys are deep into your second season and you didn't even know that you could do seasons. And I... <laughs> You oh, yeah. saved us Amateurs. from running ourselves completely into the ground, from never taking time off again in our lives. We thought we were just chained to our podcasting equipment forever. And then in a casual conversation, Benjamin, you said to me, so when does this season wrap up? And I went, what? A season? <laughs> <laughs> and I suggested it to Stella. And of course, she was like, brilliant. I love it. And so <laughs> off and we went, we you, took a little break. And like then two week back. break or something like we that. We took a six week break. Okay, that's decent. Uh, we plan for we plan for another break. We're going to have another seasonal break. So we're yeah. going mad. But yeah. on, <laughs> on your break, you guys, oh, well, you guys not only have done this podcast, but you also have had meetups and stuff or, or I guess uh, retreats or workshops and person workshops and stuff. So you guys are really doing a lot of work. So I wanted to have a conversation to catch up with you guys and see what you've learned about this thing called gender. Yeah. Stella, do you want to talk about the retreat then since Benjamin brought it up? Yeah. So I suppose myself and Sasha and Lisa have become friends through gender in the Lisa Marciano, of course, um, in the last few years. And I'm trying to think when we first decided this idea of having a retreat, I think we realized that there was a huge need for uh, for for some sort of psychoeducation or, or dissemination of, of, of knowledge and also support for people in the gender world. And we kind of found ourselves. I'm trying to think how we became a little group because my God, we're a little group now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't, it's un unlike, you know, you remember when the lovers meet and stuff. I can't remember how we decided. We've got this little very active WhatsApp group. <laughs> but yeah, nonstop. We talk a lot on this WhatsApp group. And yeah, so we decided anyway, in, in the midst of all the chat, that we would start this organization called Wider Lens Consulting. And we were going to make sure that, you know, our understanding of gender got out to the world in in as as a as as an efficient way as possible. And the first thing we thought of really was let we need to do a retreat for parents because our parents have been treated so badly, so badly, so badly in this world. And it was such a powerful experience. It's really hard to describe it, but it was an yeah. incredibly powerful, moving, really warm, really heartening few days. It was just beautiful. It was last March, wasn't it, in mm -hmm. Washington? Yeah, we were we met with a group of about 40 parents in Maryland, so right outside of Washington, D.C. And it was a three day retreat where 
we really wanted to give parents the opportunity to slow down and kind of tune in with their own experience of this gender thing, be able to share their story amongst like-minded parents who kind of got it, who were not going to judge them or yell at them about not being affirmative enough. Just like we wanted to get together a group of parents who could really understand each other. And we ran lots of small workshops where we were able to split up by groups based on different things like the age of the child or how long they've been identifying as trans or kind of different things going on within the family. And parents also just got a chance to kind of um, check in with themselves, uh, you know, away from the pressure of like the daily routine and driving kids to and from school. Like it was just three days where they could focus on what's going on and also share ideas with each other, support one another, laugh together. I mean, it was amazing because I, I know it's been several months now since that retreat and lots of parents have reached out to me and said, I've made lifelong friends from this. And um, it was very special. And actually, we're running a second retreat, which is going to be here in Arizona the, mm -hmm. in the fall. And so several of the parents, many of the parents who came to the first one will be back again for an advanced retreat, which will be different from what they did the first round. And then we're also opening up registration for another foundations retreat, which is kind of like parenting support 101 for those who have gender questioning kids. So we're going to be making updates to a lot of our program from last time based on feedback, based on patterns we've noticed. And we're also keeping a lot of stuff the same for those parents who are attending for the first time. Um, so it was amazing. And, you know, when we got back from the retreat, Stella and I, um, did a podcast episode about some of the things we learned while we were there working with these parents and um, the medical neglect of these vulnerable kids was just so it's like we knew those things because of course like we talk about this stuff with parents constantly but just to hear story after story after story of kids with really complicated backgrounds just being treated like a number like you can just send them down the gender clinic to send them down the gender path it was it was unbelievable are you able to uh, anonymize and specify or tell us a, a little bit about the sampling or the patterns in a little bit more detail just so people can kind of get it uh, in their heads i remember a few things i don't i, don't, I can't think uh, right off the top of my head one thing i remember was out of i don't know how many parents was well, something like seven parents that the, the therapist had decided, seven families as such, the therapist had decided had had been the first person to bring up the issue of gender, if you follow me. And th that was stunning at the time because it was like, what? The therapist brought it up? Like it wasn't in the realm. It wasn't this was a child who had other issues. And the therapist suggested that maybe gender was the issue when it wasn't and it became the issue. I remember that was really shocking as like, that's a good proportion of, of parents. And that is, and an, it, it felt, I remember myself and Sasha, we were sitting beside each other and we turned to each other uh, kind of at the same moment saying, I'm just so ashamed of my profession. Mm -hmm. There was just so many stories of therapists behaving dismissively. And I hate to say it because, you know, I, I love psychotherapy I, I i know this it's not done to kind of say something like this but it really did come out very strong that the therapists had been a a really destructive force in these families lives that was for me the strongest takeaway there was a first night where we all sat down it was a circle and the idea was each parent was going to our parents if they were together was going to although um just discuss you know, kind of who they were, a little bit of an introduction. And that night turned into this epic kind of yeah. event where they yeah. just they were telling story after story after story. And you couldn't have sat there and not gone, who are these therapists? What are they doing? Who are these doctors? They are wrecking families. Like, like it was, it was quite clearly where you would make the villain of the tale. Okay, it so wasn't, it was quite clear. It was horrible. 
And the sample of this population, this, these are Americans, probably upper middle class. It, well, yes, but we also had some international attendees. We had some families from Canada too, I believe, and India. I mean, so all, all over the place, but yes, largely American families all over the US. This is not all necessarily just like, you know, Portland families. This is all over the US in both conservative and progressive or liberal states. Um, predominantly parents of girls, though we, of course, quickly, it was quickly reiterated to us that the parents of boys need their own supports because their stories are dramatically different. And we can touch on that a little bit too. Wait, are you saying that sex matters? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> okay. um, well spotted, Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, that was really very noticeable. I mean, very quickly we realized the parents of boys are dealing with a very different kind of situation, though, of course, there are parallels, right? There are overlapping themes insofar as like these kids are all struggling socially. They're all vulnerable. They're all they all tend towards pretty rigid thinking. They're all struggling with other complicated mental health issues. Um, and the, the conflict around gender becomes really powerful force in the families. So I think Stella is right to point out the medical neglect. Um, Another theme that I noticed was just the secrecy that so many parents were living with. So there were parents who had been dealing with this for multiple years with their children. Some were brand new as well. Like some of our parents were there, their kids had just announced trans within a few months and were already having surgeries like very, very quickly, rapid succession. But many of these parents had been dealing with this in their family for years without really sharing with anybody because they were so afraid of how friends, neighbors, other parents at the school would react, like really worried about being pushed towards affirmation or not knowing um, how people would respond to them or being judged as transphobic or something like that. So many parents, you could just see what a relief it was to be able to speak honestly with other adults and kind of have that trust in the room. It was amazing to see that. I, I remember uh, two parents, they knew each other. They were from a, a similar area and they didn't know each other had issues with their children's gender identity. So there was a, a kind of a gorgeous moment. They, yeah, they walked in and saw each other and they were like, <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. I mean, what are the odds of that? Neither of them were from the state of Maryland or anywhere within the Northeastern <laughs> United States. So that was unbelievable. One well, thing was really, one thing was really nice. Yeah, 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 very definitely scary. One thing that was really nice for me, um, because I came over from Ireland, I'm always been kind of impressed upon about the, you know, the cultural, political polarization that's going on in America. And I'm becoming more sensitive to it, kicking and screaming, but I am. <laughs> and uh, what happened was lovely that I, I saw the red and the blue connect with each other in the room where one person said something like, you know, I'm a gun toting farmer from Texas and I vote you know, whatever they would vote. And uh, the next person said, you know, I'm a liberal and um, I'm from Texas and I don't agree with any of your politics. However, I completely identify with your story. It surpassed. Now, that was, you know, a garbled version of what went on, but it was extraordinary just watching. And they were smiling warmly, warmly at each other. And they were like, yeah, yeah, politics, whatever. This is happening to our families. And you love your kid. I love my kid. And that surpasses everything. There's something about when you talk about something you love, it brings out a tenderness in us. Mm. And there was a tenderness between the families. There was no, they completely laughed about the fact that they politically kind of technically hated each other. And there was an utter connection because so, of the family. So in a way, they are sharing a common enemy, but because the enemy is uh, t wrapped up in the fate of their child, they also shared a common good in a way when they met. Yeah, I just think that's a... Interesting yeah, I mean, oh, please. Well, well, I was, I was just gonna say. I mean, I think um, the the common enemy would just kind of be the entire zeitgeist, and also 
I mean, I got a little bit derailed, I have to say. I don't know what I was going to say. But but another thing that I'm thinking about is just like, in terms of the whole medical scandal piece, people kept thinking, and I kept thinking, where are the journalists? This is such a shocking, unbelievable set of stories. You would think that journalists are, well, I would say that papers or the the wall street journal and the new york times that they'd be banging down the doors of these parents to cover this story and of course we know some journalists who are now writing on substack and things like that who have done an amazing job covering this so i'm not saying there aren't any but you would think that this is the story of the century and it's so interesting to see how terrifying it's been for these big papers to cover it and, and even further, it's not only the story of the century, it's the story of the liberal left of the century. It's it's specifically very prominent among the, the liberal left progressives. It's not only, it's both sides, but it is very notably in, in, in that world. So often parents are saying, you know, I'm a liberal, I'm, I've always voted. Mm. They, they say it so often, it is mm. notable for me anyway. And um, it, it makes me look so darkly upon journalists because I like I don't look darkly on many people as you might notice. But the journalists got into journalism to tell the truth, to be the truth tellers, to to look at the monster under the rug, to tell the stories that other people were afraid not to tell. That is why they got into it. And when they were faced with the challenge of their career, so many of them looked away. And some of them were phenomenal. Abigail Shire obviously stands out for, for her bravery, but some of them were very, very brave and, and went for it. But the vast majority either dipped their toe in and backed the hell out because, frankly, they would be unpopular. And there's this, I often think, very strong story about everybody says that my job wouldn't sustain it and I'd lose my job. And I think... Personally, this is a lot more about public shaming and it's a lot more about popularity than is maybe said. Now, I know that's debatable and you can all disagree with me and I welcome it if you do. But I do think that public shaming has kept society in check for thousands of years. And that's how we have operated as society. And it feels to me when I penetrate the stories of all these people who have spoken to me, including many, many, many journalists, it's it's more about popularity. They couldn't face the public shaming, the shunning, the the kind of the rejection from their own class. Okay, their own group. that being the case, and I, I no doubt that is a very strong force to sculpt um, or to cover for this story or to cover what's going on. But when you have the president of the United States, which is nominally the most powerful uh, office in this land and possibly the world supporting this, throwing the full weight of the executive branch, throwing the Department of Justice behind this. When you have the state of California becoming a sanctuary where minors can just go there and get operated on, like, and then you have the education system, you have the therapy um, mm -hmm. profession. And there's something, it's interesting, we don't have to get into the, what it is it about the left or the leftish that makes it susceptible to this or that's promoting this, but it is a systemic, this is the definition of a systemic issue. It is huge. So, right. Mm -hmm. I, I think actually in fairness in America, you are more likely to lose your job. I think in Ireland, it's public shaming. And I think in England, it's 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 a lot more closer to public shaming. But in America, it does sound like it's a lot more likely you could actually lose your job. Well, not just lose your job, but lose all the opportunities. Like Lisa Celine Davis has basically yeah. been kicked out of the profession. Sasha, what were you? Um, I, I keep finding myself in conversations with people who are outside of this gender world where gender will come up, okay? And what I have noticed is that people outside of this debate, they're only aware of some of the most kind of, I guess, public facing aspects of this, like someone like Aaliyah Thomas, like people might know about that. People might have seen, you know, on YouTube, a video of a trans woman who doesn't pass at all screaming about pronouns. And those are the stories that people seem to be aware of. And it's, 
it may be shocking, but like, unless you're a female athlete or a coach or a parent of a kid on the swimming team, it's like, that's really weird. Sucks to be those girls. And then you move on or you think that person seems mentally unwell. I don't know what's going on there, but I actually don't think in terms of the public, people were really know what's happening with kids and only recently have I seen this debate coming into slightly more of the spotlight and um you know every time you and I talk Benjamin I, I tend to think we're on the cusp of something but Stella and I really think now we are especially with the Tavistock closing so much is happening in Europe which is hopefully setting a precedent but I think the more people recognize this, the medicalization of children aspect, I think we will be in a better place for journalists to step in. I mean, I know when that New York Times piece was written, I had some issues with aspects of it. You can probably link it in the show from, notes. From last fall? No, the recent, the more recent one. Just about a month ago. Yeah, about a month ago, talking about the something about like the debate about childhood gender therapy and, or gender you know, medicine the, or something. journalist was was very very detailed she she interviewed so many different yes. people, interviewed loads of people from genspect and then i i wasn't thrilled about the reference to genspect right. because she started talking about gun toting people i was like what the hell has that got to yeah. do with it? but she wrote a you know what she felt was a, a you know both sides article which for the new york times is is felt seismic um, but she got an awful lot of abuse. She really did. Yeah. Uh, she she got a very hard time for it. Yeah. But I mean, I think that that's a step in the right direction. It, it was acknowledged that there is a debate. Now, you know, I really admire this journalist, even though she and I probably don't agree with everything about how she framed the debate. I really admire her for sticking her neck out there because as Stella said, she got a lot of uh, criticism for it, probably from both sides. And that's what happened when 60 Minutes aired their piece about, um, you know, childhood gender medicine, and they touched on detransition in a short segment there, and they really got it from both sides. So I admire any journalist or, or television program that's willing to put the story out there. I think what I'd really like to see is that the opposition to childhood gender men, gender medicine is not only coming from the right it's not only coming from religious conservatives it's coming from the left as well and they didn't really represent any of the left progressive voices that also have really serious problems with what's happening and they didn't really spend enough time in my opinion talking about what are the kind of global changes that we're seeing around this the science behind gender medicine and what are these other progressive liberal countries doing about this mm -hmm. what are some of these global changes in gender medicine well um dr hillary cass was put in charge and stella you correct my details if i get any of this wrong but she was put in charge um, of investigating the tavistock uh, gender identity service in the UK, which is the biggest gender service in, in the in the UK. And she spent how long, like a year and a half or something investigating? Oh, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she found that they it was not a safe service for children. And so they're in the process over the course of, uh, I think, a year or so of shutting down the service. And they're going to kind of outsource the care of the gender dysphoric youth regionally. In under other umbrellas of mental health services they, they offer to children. So rather than it being a specialized service around gender only, they're going to kind of reroute gender dysphoric kids into regional other mental health programs. Is that, did I get that kind of yeah. right? Yeah, and what, what was lovely as you did, but also she said, and she recommended a holistic approach that integrated uh, the multidisciplinary team so that it would be a much more rounded approach rather than, you know, all these kids with all these autism and ADHD and other issues just going into a gender service, which was so inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And so she she picked up on something. But the biggest thing was basically an evaluation of the gender affirmative care model and um, a, a year and a half independent review. And the evaluation was that it wasn't safe and it wasn't viable for children in the long term. It was very damning and very clear. 
And does um, that well, butt against these conversion laws in the UK or conversion ther- anti-conversion therapy laws? And to just briefly touch on that, conversion therapy used to be about trying to turn a gay person straight. Now it's trying to question or I guess question somebody's gender idea, identity uh, with the motive of changing it. So they expanded conversion therapy. Is, is there a tension there? Is there not a tension there? There will be a tension there um, because she, she has she's definitely Hillary Cass has certainly branded the the affirmative model as unsafe and unviable. And the, the conversion therapy law, it was quite interesting. Boris Johnson a few months ago did what you just pointed out. He brought in a proposed conversion therapy bill for just sexual orientation. And there was a an outcry of, no, this cannot be. You have to bring in gender identity. And so it got pushed back. In the meanwhile, Boris Johnson's kind of gone. And so you, you don't know what way it'll go now. A lot of these bills, because there's a conversion therapy bill in Ireland proposed. And I'm wondering, is is, is are a lot of these politicians just holding, waiting to see what way it's going? Because it's going very fast. If I was a politician... And I didn't have any kind of skin in the game of of gender. I'd be thinking, that's messy. Why Mm -hmm. would we make a decision on that right now? Because anybody could see it's a fast-moving landscape that making a decision now feels rash unless you really think, I'm losing, get the bill in quick. Mm. But a politician went out after you in the parliament (laughs) or some building that the politicians reside in in Ireland. That was a kerfuffle. You got shamed and pilloried on on the national stage. In the House of Parliament, yeah. Because it's in Irish, people didn't recognise that it was actually the House of Parliament, and it was. And there's parliamentary privilege, so you can say what you want effectively, you can't be sued. And um, what he said was an an incorrect quote. So um, what what the quote was, I said, I was talking to radical feminists, and they were saying, do you think we should have sympathy for autogynophilic men? And I said, my answer, this is the quote, I said, I don't think you should have sympathy and I don't think you should have empathy, but I should because I work with them. And this politician said, this, yeah, exactly. This, 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 this controversial therapist said about trans women, I don't think you should have empathy and I don't think you should have sympathy. And, he, and it was an appalling thing to do. It was incredible abuse of power and abuse of privilege. And yet again, this guy, his name is Mick Barry, and he's, he's this left wing nobody. He's a fringe kind of very extreme leftist, very heavy in the left. And he he's kind of he's propelled himself into identity politics, replaced Calas politics with identity politics will have worked for the left and for the, you know, for the working class for for decades and has suddenly in some crazed kind of, I I would say, opportunism has Mm. decided to jump into identity politics. And, you know, when anybody, I'm sure us three would know it quite quickly, they talk about gender and within 10 seconds, you think you don't know what you're talking about because you're using all the wrong language and you're falling all over the place and you can barely say the letters LGBT without getting mixed up. And he was one of those. And it's like, he quite clearly was a bit a clueless clown. And um, but he he definitely he absolutely I put in a complaint and we'll know the result of it in September. And I will certainly make known the result of it because I'm very clear about what happened. And the newspapers took up on it. Thankfully, there was some lovely articles about it. So it, in a way, in the in the larger sense of the word, it highlighted how uh, identity politics had gone mad that the, somebody had you know been literally misquoted in the door in in the house of parliament it was a horrible 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 event because he, i had no right of reply it was just mm. this is this is it felt very very frightening and i i kind of got a taste of what it must feel like to to be famous or something and to have somebody misquote you and you're like it's gone it's out yeah. and there's nothing you can do I was really frightening at the time, but I'm over it. Hmm. You survived. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. So current events being what they are, and we don't know how things are going to shake out. And it's uh, constantly developing, very multifaceted, complex topic. You guys both fell into it uh, through different ways. And we've spoken about that 
elsewhere. But with your podcast, Gender Wider Lens, you've interviewed big name after big name, and you've gone all over the place. You've mapped out. Do you guys know how many episodes you have? Like 100 or something like that? We're, we're on 82. 82. It's coming on Friday. Mm-hmm. And you've done a lot of like, you've spoken with a lot of the therapists and the researchers. And so with that said, or with that in mind, is there a there there when it comes to gender? Is gender something or is it a fantasy? Oh. You always end up somehow <laughs> asking me to define woman <laughs> in these episodes. <laughs> and I always have a moment where I'm like, there's Benjamin with his esoteric question. What the heck am I going to say every single time? <laughs> and here it is. Is there a there there when it comes to gender? Um, I'm sure your attitudes and your thoughts and opinions have changed over time. Well, I'll I'll start us off, Stella, and we can jump in together. I mean, one thing that you and I have said behind the scenes, and I hope it's okay for me to say this here, is that in the big picture, in the long run, we're not sure whether social transition is going to mean something different now than it did 50 years ago, than what it will mean 50 years from now. So I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer your question, is gender a thing? But but I will say the meaning of the trans kid is a very, I still think it's a very nefarious concept and I think it's trapping a lot of kids. But I also suspect if there was not such a serious risk of medical intervention, social transition may not be as risky as I think it is right now, when it is often, at least in the US, closely associated with medical intervention. So, you know, Stella and I have said, you know, maybe maybe we were wrong about social transition. Maybe it's not that big of a deal, you know, but I only think that's true if there wasn't such a medical um, association with it. But I don't know, that's that's an area where I, I might be exploring or changing my mind slightly. Hmm. I don't um, know. I I think there is gender. I think I think we're born in our bodies and our bodies are sh- shape our behavior and our 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 lives and some of us have maybe one level of hormones and another person has another level of hormones and it interacts with your brain and some people become very feminine and some people don't and um some people are happy with that and some people aren't. So is there a gender? Yeah, insofar as there is femininity and there's masculinity, so there is, uh, the, you could say that, that is their gender roles, that is their gender identity, the level of their femininity or masculinity. Just because that word has been walloped all over the world for the last decade, does it mean that there isn't a, 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 a kind of a, a driving concept behind it? Because... I do think some people are very feminine and some people aren't. And I do think that's quite interesting. And I do think it's very interesting, which I've, I've said to you a few times, Sasha, is, well, why are our young gay, pre-gay boys, why are they feminine? What, what, why? <laughs> it doesn't make sense and to Paul me. And Paul Vasey helped us answer that question. He well, came you on must... twice. Yeah. And what, what did you he say? say? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I remember asking him this and he was like, he said something like, um, I'm trying to remember how he phrased it. He said, well, why would it surprise you that people who are attracted to men have feminine qualities? I mean, typically across the board, who has more feminine qualities? And I said, women. And he's like, okay. I mean, I, I don't know. He just yeah, made it sound very obvious. And I almost felt stupid for asking the question at the time. <laughs> so I'll have to go back and listen to his exact wording. Yeah. Maybe we can send it to you and you can stick it in when you do your editing. Okay. Okay. I don't know what people mean when they say I don't have a gender identity because I'm, I get it. You don't have a gender identity, but we do have a gender imposition that has been placed upon us. If you follow me, that that has society has has imposed 
and that society hasn't hasn't oppo- imposed that for no reason. You know what I mean? Men did go and hunt and gather, and the women did stay at home. And you know, from that society evolved, and women did tend towards one direction, and men did. And there's always exceptions to the rule, but they proved the rule. So, I I think the kind of the the blank refusal that there isn't an impact of biology is is not true. I think there's a huge impact on our ho- hormones and shaping us. Well, to get back to what we were, what you guys were saying earlier about the different uh, treatment pathways of support for boys and girls that are obsessing or distressed over their gender identity, what are some of the ways that, or what are some of the things that boys tend to need or support that parents of boys need as opposed to girls? And that might help us kind of understand that gender is actually not just a social contract or Mm -hmm. construct. I think the femininity of the education system has hit the boys very hard. That's what you mean. I I, I think that there's certainly in in Ireland and and elsewhere too, that an awful lot of boys don't meet very many male teachers in their younger years and they don't meet many male teachers meet the odd one, but not as many as the meet female. And I think it's become a very feminized environment, you know, elementary school, primary school in, in Ireland. And I don't think that has gone very well for boys. Because... Did you go to Catholic school? So, um, just... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, because there's just, because uh, you're Irish, you think yeah. typically probably Catholic, probably Catholic yeah. school. And yeah. then that image evokes nuns running everything. So it was <laughs> a, it was an institution that was patriarchal uh, on the hierarchy level, but mm. the actual interaction between the students and the teacher was usually a woman teaching. Yeah. So w- is there a difference you see in, a, or could you describe or, or just off the top of your head, if there's a, if that was any less feminine? Catholic school with with nuns uh, whacking you on the knuckles. I guess that's not terribly feminine. Once it comes to grammar, that... women <laughs> punish you for saying the wrong thing all the time. That is very... no uh, nuns have a very strong personality of their own. That is, it's 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 phenomenally feminine in its own way, and <laughs> it's it's very complicated and uh, it's serious, like. Well, yeah. I'm just wondering if if the education system has ever not been feminine. It just seems like women gravitate towards teaching roles. Women gravitate towards, in the modern era, women extended their, it, it was kind of a feminine thing to do that was very professional to be a teacher. Okay. So it's always been kind of, in the modern times, directed by women. So I don't know if if you could give an example of how it's becoming even more feminized or how it's not adapting to boys or adapted. It's to just boys. more and more. It used to be more males would go into teaching. I suppose okay. I'm specifically talking about Ireland. Maybe it's not so in America, but it's become like it's 80, 90 percent of, of teaching in elementary are, are women. OK, so uh, to rephrase the question, then how are boys negatively affected by so-called overly feminized education? And how does that manifest in gender distress from what you guys have seen? Oh, it's just this was just an off the cuff remark I made. I'm not sure that impacts the gender distress. I think it's I was okay. actually thinking of boys aren't doing well just in general in the mm. in the education system because it's become a very much if women are shaping if if they're making the decisions about the activities and things like that that you know it's I do think boys are missing out. I do think boys are missing out in lots of different ways, just like girls are missing out in other ways, but it's nothing really to do with gender dysphoria I'm talking about. I'm talking about the larger sense of society well i mean i i haven't i don't know if i've put as much thought into like this the role schools play specifically i mean of course we can talk about some of the health ed curricula and teaching of gender identity in schools which is a more obvious problem but when i think about the the needs of the boys um which may be similar to the needs of the girls, but a little bit different. They really have a hard time in connection. And you're right in a way, Stella, they, they're not connecting with males in a way that makes them feel like part of a group. 
So whether it's through schools or through like your relationship with, you know, your dad or your group of guy friends or whatever, I think feeling like part of a group, even with your quirks, even with your idiosyncrasies, even though you are maybe a sensitive artistic type, because many of these boys are, I think that's very important. And I think when these boys fall into these online worlds, it really becomes a very obsessive, ruminative replacement for like healthy connection in the real world. And so I think it's maybe a combination of the way boys respond to tech in a way like these are these are parents who like they themselves are computer engineers and they're trying to put like blocks on their kid from looking at porn and this like 14 year old can get around all the blocks like these kids are unbelievably savvy with tech and they're super isolated um and they are incredibly intelligent so there's a bit of a like a maverick personality in these boys like oh i'm gonna go out on a limb and do something a little bit crazy and my parents are trying to stop me but i am a pioneer like there's something pioneering about the boys i don't know whereas the girls have they're like a little less certain or they do it only when their best friend does it but sometimes the boys don't know anybody else in their peer group who's doing this but they're like i found this on the internet i'm gonna figure out a way to stay on these chat forums despite what my parents want and i am gonna bullet train like the focus the laser focus you've mm. talked about this stella mm. that is something interesting and and it's very male ironically yeah yeah it feels that way have you seen um parents who have been successful who have successfully derailed their their child from unnecessary medicalization yes. um distract what what's the what are they the, get the boy onto another track just kind of take that laser and like aim it at, away from planet gender and onto planet i don't know like um yeah i was just or... i was just chatting with a mom who has been writing about her son's desistance i have also a blog on my website from a parent whose son desist i mean the way the most recent person i'm thinking about she said i just showered him with love and praise and told him every day like something positive about himself because a lot of these boys have a great deal of self-loathing for lots of reasons which we can talk about but you know she said i made him feel attractive we broadened his horizons we put him in activities we you know taking off the blindfold right just keeping a lot of stuff going on in his life staying close connecting um and kind of drawing them out of that focus on the computer and just helping them get back into life. That has been an incredibly important part of so many desistance stories. Like how do we broaden this kid's focus? And I think it's the parents who feel like they, they have completely lost control over their kids, like internet and social media use have a very hard time like doing those things because it's much more reinforcing and rewarding to be online in these chat rooms or looking at porn or whatever than doing the hard work of like trying to make a friend in real life. I mean, it's just faster and more dopaminergic is a term I've heard recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a, a mother on Twitter that I saw that said that her husband taught their son about literature. They just started reading Cervantes and, and uh, Victor Hugo and just reading literature. And that got him That's out of amazing. that gender focus. Wow. That's... Stella loves that. I know hopefully she I, does. I, I offered <laughs> to have them on. So hopefully they come oh, on. Oh, wow. Them in, That's in, so in lovely. Detail. I do think sometimes, uh, you know, that the, the parent sees it as a, as trying to bring them away from gender. And I sometimes see it as try to bring them away from the computers. Sadly, like we're on the computer here and I, I know how great it can be, but it feels like if, if they could shut the computer, shut the devices, that they have a huge step made because so much of this can be online. Not always, but it, it's yeah, quite yeah. notable. Like, Interesting. Mm -hmm. That that feeds into, 
like you were saying, a lot of normies, so-called, to this particular wheelhouse aren't really aware of just how messy it is and especially about the kids stuff. Like I was just talking to somebody this past weekend who told me some stories about meeting some people in their life who have transitioned and uh, how they just kind of adapted to that, but not really understanding just the depth of the medicalization. And when you tell somebody about phalloplasty, they're always kind of like, wait, what? You know, Um, Mm. but that's an extreme thing that's actually maybe is getting better every time they do it, but it's still uh, not as rare as one would suppose. But if that's where you're going, at least the mastectomies, what they're like 70,000 or 80,000 GoFundMe uh, fundraisers for mastectomies out there. Now it's some insane number. A lot of people Mm -hmm. don't really understand that until it affects them. And especially I was in California. So their liberal spun inclusive, you know, diversity is their main, uh, you know, moral compass that they just want to include and include and include and include and include. And that kind of blinds them or occludes them from the knowledge of what's happening in a negative way. Um, and kind of breaking through that shell and telling those stories is kind of part of the work to be done, but rescuing the children to go down that path is another thing. What What's some other novel things that you guys have, that completely blew you out of the way um, doing your podcast, doing uh, your work? For, for me, the, the, the one that, the, the episode that blew me away, the episode that blew my mind was, I suppose Steensma and DeVries was, was, was such a, a extraordinary. <laughs> These are famous people in our world. Steensma and DeVries are the Dutch model. And they they created the concept of puberty blockers. They pioneered the idea. From that, you know, Americans, you know, clinicians came over to see the Dutch and brought it back, almost like, you know, the, the white man brought things over to America. They brought it back. They brought it over to America. And everything exploded from that. And it all it all stems back to the Dutch. And the Dutch were De Vries, Steensmet, these are two people. And also there was a third um who who wasn't in our episode. But we uh we interviewed De Vries and Steensma. And it was I I was so uptight that week, the week that we were interviewing them, and me and Sasha, we were messaging each other. I felt like it was almost just ridiculous, but a boxer preparing for a fight. <laughs> I was really pumped yeah. up. Like I wanted to make sure I didn't think really we mightn't get a chance again. I wasn't sure. I'd love if they did come back, but I wanted to ask so many questions about what happened. How did how did this happen? Who created this? extraordinary authoritarian decision to stop children's sexual awakening and sexual development and to literally impede the their 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 growing up literally stop it and think that this was a good idea and um it, it just feels so authoritarian it, like, it feels like something from you know uh Soviet Russia or something for me it does mm-hmm. and um so we asked them loads of questions. We had to be very prepared for it because they just do the research. They do the clinical trials. And for me, that episode, now I loved Dr. Levine. I loved Stephen Levine's the episode, but he was singing my song and he just knew so much more than I knew. And I was yeah. reveling in it. But the Steensma and DeVries episode was the most shocking hour in my life. Yeah, for me, it was really intense. Well, yeah, and let me give some give context. Yeah, yeah, so so we, we did something <laughs> called the Pioneers series, where we tracked down all of the important researchers, clinicians, doctors, um, who have studied gender for many, many years. And so most of the people we interviewed were people who had been kind of Uh, ostracized from the field because perhaps they were advocating for more of a slow approach, let's not rush to medicalize children, so on and so forth. Um, So like Dr. Stephen Levine, who Stella referenced, is a psychiatrist who's given a lot of expert testimony about uh, gender transition and has been treating gender patients since the 70s. And he has a lot of concerns about that this is a 
not a really a helpful way to to treat people with really serious mental health issues. And he talks about love and the importance of being able to build intimate relationships with people and all of the patients he's seen over the years have really complicated stories. And so he's been a really big advocate of slowing down. So, you know, someone like Stephen Levine, we agree with him on so much and he's so wise. I mean, his his episode was a huge hit. People loved him. But there was nothing he said that we would disagree with. We were just, you know, enjoying basking in his wisdom. Um, and I mean, I, I maybe don't frame things exactly the way Stephen does. You know, he's he's got decades of experience. He was, you know, educated in a different time and place. But but the point is, when we had the Dutch researchers come on, these were people from a different camp. These were people from the camp of medicalizing children, which was new for me and Stella. And interestingly, the Dutch research is often uh, pointed at, even by advocates of slowing down, as like the model research, because the, the thinking is that they screened their patients very carefully. All of the children had early onset gender dysphoria. These are children who did not have other complicated mental health issues. And so that's often contrasted with the current population of ROGD kids who have a ton of psychiatric issues. They, they start identifying as trans only in their adolescent years. There's clearly a social contagion element. So people often say, you know, the Dutch, they did it properly because they were more selective in who got to transition, but these were still children. And what was so interesting is like, when you look at the Dutch research, it's still incredibly low quality evidence and of a very small sample of uh, like 15 kids, somebody died. One of the research participants died. Is that right? It was 15, right? One of 15? Well, of a sample of 70. 70. Mm. Yes, yeah, 70. One oh, the died. 55, yeah. Yeah, 70, there were 70 originally. 15 became effectively disqualified from the study because of their lack of health after they took the puberty blockers. That would be my, you know, some of them had obesity, some of them had complications, but they started the study and they backed out of the study. 15 of them backed out. And then one of them died as a result of complications because of genital surgery. And this is the gold standard. This is the cream of the crop. This is the studies, the big, there was two studies, this 15, the 55 and the 70, but it's the same group of, of children. And we were told this was the gold standard. And when you look at the gold standard, you think, well, one died out of 70, 15 dropped out and complicated reasons, but they didn't look great reasons. Already, this isn't a gold standard study. Already, this isn't a great study. And it's a small study. It's 70. 70 so, kids. For the, like, it's, the, it's unbelievable the power this study has had. What they were tracking was full transition for these 70 kids, like Lupron and then hormones and then surgical. They wrote one paper after the puberty blockers, and then they wrote their second paper after they were followed up with cross-sex hormones and genital surgery. So in the case of FTMs, that was considered mastectomy, right? Mm -hmm. And then in the case of MTFs, they had they had their vaginoplasties. And so the, the death was due to a complication from the vaginoplasty. Um, and furthermore, I mean, what I thought was really interesting, look, I'm, I'm a therapist, I'm a clinician. So reading research is not something that I have done frequently up until I started doing this work. So there are probably people way better qualified to analyze it from like a statistical perspective. But one thing that I learned that I thought was very interesting was of those 15 people who didn't end up going on to treatment, when they followed up with them, 11 of the 15 did not regret not transitioning. So Aside from some of the specific medical complications, I think there were some big philosophical questions that Steensma and DeVries hadn't seemed concerned to grapple with. And like when we were interviewing them, Stella and I were asking questions about, like, for example, Stella asked this wonderful question about patient zero, who essentially was 
DeVries's first gender client that was a 16 year old girl who was or, or maybe younger or something who was so distressed about puberty was just freaking out about puberty and from a place of real compassion DeVries was like I saw this person suffering and I knew we had to do something to help them she's obviously a compassionate researcher and clinician and the long term outcome of that person is that they had genital surgery, they transitioned, and later in life felt a great deal of shame about their genitals post-surgery. And Stella kind of said, you know, that doesn't seem like a great outcome to me. And basically, like when we kept asking them about the difficulty that their patients had with finding connection or love or making peace with their bodies, we kind of got the same answer, which was like, well, they were very messed up to begin with. We can't expect great life outcomes for these people. I mean, they didn't say it that way, right? I don't want to put words in their mouth, but that's the gist that we kept getting. And they even made the analogy of like, well, if someone comes in to the doctor with diabetes and the doctor cures their diabetes and they never get married, is that the doctor's fault? And it's like, well, those are different things because diabetes treatment doesn't F up your genitals. like. <laughs> what like it was such a weird framing yeah. I, I it was like we were talking about totally unhuman subjects it was like we were talking about aliens or something oh so somebody without uh psychological problems it sounds like they were seeing gender distress as not a psychological problem if they're comparing it to diabetes it's like your gender is like your pancreas right it's just just something that's wrong we're going to fix it rather than there's all this other stuff going on yeah yeah but they were also quite clearly saying uh, in different ways but basically these they had a low expectation of happiness for these people so while they were technically seeing it as a physical problem they certainly weren't expecting from what the way they spoke about them they weren't expecting functioning adults that's right to emerge that's right it's a bit disingenuous because you can't you can't pretend it's a physical problem and then expect low functioning adults and that's do you understand that's a contradiction really but so it's like that palliative thing, care it's like giving very, somebody very, like very, morphine very, as they that's die that's what it was like and it was the the attitude towards us was what are you expecting do you know these yeah people? right right we were like idealistic students yeah like we were naive or something yeah <laughs> and just to talk about that patient zero that patient zero is the only person really that we have the long term study the one student when you sit back on the experiment that's going on it's it's shocking but this patient zero as sasha said you know Honestly, it was a phobia almost, or certainly a very of puberty. Experience yeah. of puberty and of periods that drove the puberty blocker decision. It wasn't gender dysphoria. And an entire industry around gender dysphoria has evolved. And this patient zero is the long term study. And this patient zero, you know, has transitioned and therefore they are considered a, a success because they have transitioned and for no other reason they're a success. But that was that was period phobia or puberty phobia. And that's not highlighted enough. That's that's a kind of a, to me, that's a big deal. The, the entire yeah. the entire conversation with them, it's still reeling around my head. Of, Same. I'd Did love they, to I'd love to go again. Have they updated? Because I know that there are places in Europe is Dutch. One of the places are the Dutch, one of the groups in Europe that are changing their stance on child transition and stuff or is that Sweden yeah. and UK? Sweden and Finland and France oh, and the UK yeah. have updated. But not but the Dutch, right. I get the very strong impression that it's I'm from a small country and they're from a small country and there's a real feeling from them I might be wrong but we have been propelled into being world experts and we will protect this this position. Now I, I might be wrong but I I think you could be forgiven for feeling like that if you did some studies Benjamin, and if you suddenly became a world expert, it's it's a heady feeling, mm -hmm. and I, I I I can understand how you think. I we did good studies, and now everybody's telling us they're absolutely brilliant, pioneering, world class studies. Well, thank you very much. Hmm. Maybe ego is the real diabetes. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's interesting because 
there's also something about medical advancement that is just like if something we've been doing medically doesn't feel quite right you then have a kind of fork in the road choice either we look at going backwards and maybe mm -hmm. opting out of this or we look for the solution which is also medical so like when we were talking about for example when you put a male on puberty blockers and there isn't enough tissue to create a fake vagina they said with a lot of confidence and hopefulness well you can make one out of the anus or out of the colon so it's like rather than questioning whether or not this is a great idea to do this to small children the answer is well, let's find a different medical solution which is equally Frankensteinian or whatever i mean I, it, maybe it's i just don't have the stomach for certain things but like that moment really i, I can i'll never stop thinking about that moment it was it was a clash between the medical model and the psychotherapists, you know, <laughs> and the psychotherapists were all about the psyche and the medical model were just so into the medical interventions. And you're right, that moment of, oh, no, you could make it from the from the anus and our the mouth, colon. I think it was yeah. the colon. Was it the colon? Yeah. And, and our then it, just not joking, really. doesn't it kind of sweat bioflora or something like that? Anyways. <laughs> there was the other um the 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 lead woman down in LA I think it is. Uh, I can't remember her name. She's Joanna she, Olson Kennedy. Yeah, she admitted nonchalantly. I, I have the clip. I probably put it in here about how no male that we've put on puberty blockers or that we've transitioned before they've achieved orgasm. Oh, Marcy ever. Bowers. Every single child who was, or adolescent, who was truly blocked at Tanner stage two is has never experienced orgasm. I mean, it's, it's really about zero. Blockers prevent the rise of testosterone and they don't really go on testosterone at or around surgery or into adulthood. And so we don't know. They're going to have this sensation. There's no question about that. Um, but are they going to be able to achieve sexual satisfaction? It's important in relationships. And I know that from my work with female genital mutilation survivors, that, that the lack of being able to be intimate with a partner is very important. And so this is what really raised the red flag for me is to say, look, we're going to really, we need to have our eyes open about it. I think it's been beneficial talking about it. Joe and many others have reported to me, you know, they've, they've changed their approach a little bit in their informed consent models and that they're, we're talking about masturbation now. We're talking about, okay, that's a, an area of the body that's got very dysphoric for you, but you know what? It's all a penis is, is just a large clitoris. I mean, let's, we're all, it's all the same material. It really is. So, uh, so, you know, use it for, for, for the pleasurable purposes, partially that it was intended. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. It's just so mm -hmm. offhanded and odd. But again, I mean, I guess if we think about it from the perspective of the Dutch researchers or some of these physicians, I think the interview really highlighted for me that the the kind of fundamental assumption is that these people are so disturbed, like gender dysphoria is so bizarre and disruptive that we cannot expect normal trajectories. We can't expect normal love lives. We cannot have the same expectations of these people as we would of like a more typical child. So all bets are therefore off, which is similar to what the suicide narrative does, right? Like when that is brought up over and over, what we're saying is, yes, messing with the child's fertility is bad, but this child is suicidal, which we know that that's not accurate. Like that's been kind of shown to be way exa exaggerated, not quite right. But if you assume that this child is so unusual and so special that all bets are off, in terms of normal ethical concerns that we have about medicalization right yeah uh, it's just it, one would think i know they're rewriting history to make it trans they're trying to trans history in a lot of ways in order to justify it post hoc 
But it, it seems like people would have been dropping like flies left and right from gender dysphoria before 1995, but it doesn't seem to be the case or yeah. I guess something else was going on that was keeping people unaware yeah. of their transness or having uh, can can i ask stella a question yes it's funny because i want to ask you on such oh, oh that's, that's okay i mean this childhood gender dysphoria that that's not my experience oh yeah and i i mean i think about the kids that were being seen in the dutch clinic and i wonder what their outcomes would have looked like had they just been given time and space but stella that is your story and you have, you have a healthy, beautiful life, and you are an incredibly productive, wonderful person with a family and kids and joys and sorrows like everybody else. You weren't some exception with a crazy, weird hunchback lady living alone, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, how do you keep yourself from just freaking out when you hear people say, like, well, what do you expect? These are trans kids. Like, I, 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 I think I am freaking out. I think the the level of work I'm doing is the <laughs> <laughs> manifestation of my freak out. Because I, I think if if I hadn't had that experience, you know, I think that I'd be I'd be cooler. But because I I left it so behind, if you follow me, that I had my gender issues for many years as a child. And I was as strong as any of them, you know, and I I always think they miss this whole point of yet you can have very strong gender issues and you can also be a very forceful personality and the combination of the two. Yeah, perhaps more intimidating than having very strong gender issues and not having a forceful personality, you know, those two. But this idea that some godlike clinician can look into the heart of an 11 year old and say, you you will m- maintain your trans identity while you, the other child beside them, won't. Who is this God clinician that can see that? Because I would have, they would have p- chosen me. I, I'm fully sure they would have chosen me. They would have chosen me for force of personality as well as for force of gender. I had both. So they, they just, they, they couldn't have missed me. I would have passed right through into those clinical trials and it would have been a disaster. It would have been a disaster because I I suppose I would have lived a very heavily medicalized life. And instead, I've become completely accepting of my body. I've had two children. The best things that I've ever had in my life is my two children by a country mile. And so w- what I would have missed would have been my kids, which would take my breath away. It really would. It really would. You make me cry. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. It's, it's terrible to think that children, they would have looked at children like me and said, you know, she she doesn't have any expectations. Yeah, she either. doesn't stand a chance. Just She's odd. Off with her boobs. Oh. It's like a red queen moment. Yeah. The hubris of these. It, it feels very authoritarian. <sighs> Sasha, what I wanted to ask you was, what was your episode that blew you away? Because we just lashed into my Oh, one. yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that was definitely one. That was definitely one. Um, gosh, we've done a lot of really powerful episodes. Uh, I mean, I, I think this this episode in my mind feels really closely associated with the Dutch episode, so it's it's just coming up for me. But I think the episode with Anne Lawrence blew me away. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> that so was Anne, a shocking, shocking episode. <laughs> that and, was one of those afterwards. That was all, that whole Pioneer series. It was getting not. It was just getting. Wilder. More and more intense with every, I mean, if That's anybody's interested, you got to check out the Pioneer series. <laughs> it is like a very, it, okay. First of all, I have to say, I am so grateful to all of the guests who came yeah. on because I think the poor Dutch, to be honest, Stella and I were joking. These poor people have no idea who we are and they don't realize like what our position is. So they went into it completely blind. And at the end they were like, 
oh, you guys knew your stuff. You asked hard questions. And we were like, oh, they've never heard our podcast before. They don't know who we are. They thought we were just two and naive got, idealists <laughs> that was really funny because you yeah. could see them getting more and more kind of yeah we would ask questions and they'd be like uh anyway and then Anne lawrence is Anne lawrence is um a trans woman who has written a book called men trapped in men's body she's a psychiatrist right or a researcher a researcher mm -hmm. I'm trying I'm to get my up. facts straight yeah. um yeah. And anyway, Anne Lawrence is this kind of elusive figure because she worked with Dr. Ray Blanchard, male to female trans woman. She worked with Dr. Ray Blanchard, who kind of gave her for the first time, as she describes it, like a framework for understanding the way her gender dysphoria was. And so when she wrote Men Trapped in Men's Bodies, that book got a, a lot of a, a praise from other people who had read it. Of course, it's a small little academic community, but also Anne Lawrence is considered a bit of a heretic now because Anne Lawrence describes autogynephilia, the experience of falling in love with the idea of oneself as a woman and having an erotic fixation on that. She describes it in great detail. She interviewed like dozens and dozens of males with autogynephilia for this book. And um, she's never really been interviewed before. She's older. She's like in her 70s, right, Stella? She's a psychologist and she's 70. Psychologist. So it was amazing to have her on. She was so honest and so transparent about everything she'd been through. And she talks about being a child and how she just developed this aversion to her male genitals and talked about some shocking things that we were not expecting her to say about wanting to castrate herself basically as a kid when she was younger as though that was a completely viable option and she's you know said i'm not in any way advocating for this for others but in my mind that would have been a good solution for me so the reason i say this feels so associated with the dutch research is because Let's say hypothetically that all the children the Dutch had met were saying things like what Anne Lawrence was saying. Like, literally, if you give me the medication and a knife, I will castrate myself. Then, of course, they would think we can't expect a very typical outcome. This is a person at risk of literally harming their own body. So I don't think that's how most gender dysphoric children are. But like Anne Lawrence had such a, a a palpable and shocking aversion to to her male genitals that I thought, wow, well, if this is the typical patient, I could understand why you wouldn't expect a very normal trajectory in terms of like relationships and body acceptance. And I also pressed Anne Lawrence a little bit about what kind of therapy she had had. And it wasn't a great therapy story. It was not a compassionate, warm understanding. Let's take our time and go through your history and talk about self-loathing. She never had that kind of therapy. So I, I still believe that psychological intervention that is positive and accepting is, is number one, but I definitely could see how distressing it would be to a clinician to have a patient like that and try to think like, well, what, what can I do for this person right now? If I'm not thinking about slow long-term therapy, what can we do right now? And I could understand maybe why the Dutch felt like puberty blocking is a good choice. I interviewed, uh, I think it's uh, Jada who uh, performed a uh, self castration. I think streamed it on onto YouTube <laughs> a few oh my years gosh. ago. Sweet, no sweet. But uh, I want to say female, uh, not a female, a male, but um, trans sweet, woman. sweet trans woman. Very sweet trans woman. Very nice and lovely performed what online uh like chop, chop try to chop off the testicles their testicles uh and and like streamed it uh the process on I youtube i want to check who jada is because i've listened to like almost all of your interviews and uh, i want to remind our geop i think our geop or something oh okay and did did she succeed or what? No, happened? she had to go to the emergency room and and convince the doctors to finish the job, and they wouldn't do it. But finally, convinced the doctors to finish the job. So, um, all in the one night, she convinced them that night. Or I think uh, I think it it was botched, and 
uh, th- I can try to, this is going to, there's so many links in the description. I can, the, the blog post is still up, like describing the, the whole process and gory detail. It's pretty in, in t- very, very intense. You see, I, I story, have a little bit of a different the, read of that. The person's so chill yeah. to talk to. Yeah. It was just such a contrast. Anyways, sorry, sorry. What's your read of that, Stella? Uh, uh, no more than my read of Anne Lawrence's. You know, this whole chill about everything except that. You know, if if you've met people with with eating disorders, they can be chill. They can be so kind of so in society and so in the world, except for one thing where they are absolutely their madness lies, if you follow me. And we can do that as humans. We can be really, really, really functional in every single area. And there's one area where the, the, the it's just, you know, not right on some level. And I, I, I kind of think that would be my read with, with with somebody who's castrating themselves online or somebody who is castrating themselves on any anywhere. And I, I think that's not to do with gender dysphoria. That's to do with somebody who's who's hurting themselves. That's well, they're, to do they're with trying to Donald accept Donald. eunuchs into the LGBT thing. I saw that the other day. W uh, have a chapter or something on eunuchs. Yeah. 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 Isn't that weird? It's yeah. Graceful. I think I think there's something alien about sexuality. I think there's something about sexuality that is so powerful and overwhelming and still kind of alien or gross or low. Yeah. It's it's something about the human experience that is reaches to the height of our capacity to feel and and to be in unity with somebody but also kind of nests a lot of darkness. And so it's kind of it's estranged from normal life. We don't if mm-hmm. you're a good person, you don't bring that into you. You keep it away. You keep it behind the black curtain in a way, right? So, but it's always there. It's always mm-hmm. informing mm-hmm. us and stuff. And mm-hmm. and so it's. I think that every society grapples with that darkness or that weirdness, that queerness, uh, in unique ways, and it can drive the engine of culture. Uh, you know, like people bring up the '70s and the gender bending rock stars and stuff like that. Like that was it wasn't all that special, but I guess it was kind of breaking down those norms and it was about sexuality. And now with uh, us enshrining sexuality is, uh, you know, we have a month of just wild abandon where we celebrate butt sex. And then a month later where we refuse to talk about the consequences of butt sex, because now there's a disease going around from all this butt sex. I'm sorry. There's the monkey pox thing. Sorry to bring butt sex into this. I'm just saying we have pride month, which is just wild abandon. (laughs) And then we, and then we still can't really deal with the consequences of what we're celebrating at the same time. It doesn't seem like any culture necessarily is well adjusted. We look down on the Puritans, for being mm-hmm. all for for bottling it all up and the Catholics for bottling all up. But you can kind of understand what they're bottling up because once unleashed, it's a messy, messy business. It's amazing how many religions were so puritanical and oppressive around sex. And it's it's like for thousands of years they understood that that way anarchy lies. We need mm. to keep the women in check sexually. And then they will in turn keep the men in check and that will keep our society uh, on some level, you know, grounded, steady. It's like the religions had that kind of wrapped up thousands of years ago that they needed to keep sexuality really quite a tight rein on it. And that's why they had so many. Because when I was younger and I was thinking, why is the Catholic Church obsessed with our genitals? It's so strange. It was so, it couldn't get my head around mm-hmm. it till I realized that it was a societal um, decision from the religions, that this is how we keep our society together. We need to really be very, very forceful about do not have sex with wild abandon because it will lead to some sort of anarchic situation that we will have no control over. That's my read of it. Mm-hmm. Sasha, wild abandon or no? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm just thinking about a similar trajectory in terms of when I was young, I thought it was so ridiculous how much fear and control there was around sexuality. And, I, you know, I just thought oh, this is so regressive. 
And as I've gotten older and I've just seen, it's like, it's like you're trying to kind of contain like a something and it just keeps popping out in the crevices of the container in weird ways that like you don't know what to do with them then. And I, I see that. I mean, I, I think I have this more like evolutionary understanding of the power. I don't think I understood that when I was younger. And I don't know, I can't think off the top of my head of a society that has done this the most successfully. I mean, do you guys have a generation or a decade or a place or time where you think, you know, I think this society at this moment channeled this in really healthy, productive ways. Like, can you think of anything that you're like, see as a more of a model? Well, I mean, you, you look at the sexual revolution and we're mopping up after that. It's it once the oh, sexual the revolution happened, we're, we're dealing with the fallout and it's not going to stop anytime soon. We're still so um, that's the only oh. time I've lived in. Um, but you, you, you think about the Roman Empire, you kind of associate the fall with uh, the playing around with gender and the loss of sexual um, re, uh, norms. Um, but then again, you look back to the Greeks and you see a lot of uh, homosexuality. So that uh, that homosexuality in and of itself didn't, doesn't seem to be anti-civilization, no. though the pederasty no, no. is kind of disturbing from our point of view. What does that mean, pederasty? Uh, the old men getting with young boys, Oh, oh. which was kind of par for the course in mm-hmm. Greece. It's, 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 it's rampant kind of chaos with sex is, is where... I think where the religions landed because they didn't know who would be the father and they they needed to keep this is my read of it they needed to keep a a society where fathers would look after families and if they didn't know who the father was then there would be a lot of abandonment and so they they kept it very tight can I recommend a really good book that kind of touches on this um let me see if I can remember the exact name of it. It might be propping up my computer. Hmm? It's by Sarah Blaffer Hardy. I think it's called Motherhood. She's oh, a. You shared that. With have me. I talked about this before? To me, it's a no, great no. book. She's um she's either an anthropologist or an evolutionary biologist, about? and she studies basically the the relationships that mothers in nature have with family with reproduction with babies with infanticide she looks at all these different societies wow. both human and non-human and it is a fascinating read because first of all it kind of bucks a lot of the thinking that females are always more nurturing and always more warm and always more peacemakers and kind of talks about the wild beast nature of moms in nature you know both human and animal And also that, you know, women, females have had to make decisions about their sexuality, their reproductive choices, their mating, and their, you know, having children based on all kinds of things, like whether or not they're resourced, whether they have support, whether there's enough food, whether this is the appropriate season to raise a baby. Like, so there were all these things that I'd never really thought about, because when you think of like, the biological nature of male and female you just you do think about like men are more aggressive and they're the hunters and the gatherers which is you know well women gather too but but she also kind of lifts up that women have an aggressive side too for different kinds of reasons and they have to be fiercely protective of their own um bodies and their capacities to like give birth when it makes sense like all these interesting things wow it's a good one Gender. Gender. We're back. We're back to the question <laughs> of the hour. <laughs> so you guys are wrapping up season two. Uh, this, what's it called again? That the extra special saucy mini series that you guys did? The, the Pioneers. The Pioneers, Pi- Pioneers series. series yeah. yeah. Do you, where do you guys see yourselves headed for the next year and a half? Or uh, Vacation. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
<laughs> we are taking more. a break, which I can't stop thinking about. <laughs> I'd love to do more series uh, like that because that Pioneer series was really moving. And I'd love yeah. when we come back. We're going to, we've a good few weeks left, so it's not imminent really. Oh, yeah. Like, but let's say if we take a break in November, we come back in January. I'd love if we thought of another series that was matching the, the Pioneer series as an idea because it was an incredibly engaging kind of event in our lives. It was really, really, it really felt we were doing something really important. And maybe it's yeah. kind of bombastic to say it, but it felt it felt really important to kind of catalogue people like Ken Zucker and Steensman DeVries. Which, and Benjamin, you have interviewed many of these people. Yeah. I mean, you You're... really started that that process of like, let's get together the real experts. So we really have to tip our hats to Benjamin Boyce. I mean, you have the biggest archive of these kinds of conversations. Well, but you it, guys it was are catching cool up to pretty do quick. it in a, in a series mm-hmm. like that. It was really like, I don't think we realized how much we'd learn. And then we did like a mid series analysis and post series. And it was really fun to kind of think through it together. Mm-hmm. It's nice to have a co-host, but yeah, we'd love to do another similar series of I'd sorts. love to. Yeah. yeah. Well, and looking at the landscape from a content creator perspective, which I know you guys are probably still trying to f- see yourselves as content creators, but what yeah. what's the territory that you see is ripe for the exploring? I have one. Huh? Um, I and we've touched on this a bit, Stella. I believe we are going to see a new generation of trans identified young people that are kind of saying, get your medicine off my body. And I think they're going to be saying, I can define myself how I want. I can look how I want. I don't need testosterone to be a real man. And I think eventually that that philosophy will probably not stand the test of time. But I'm all about subverting the medical uh, industry in this regard and saying, hey, I don't need doctors telling me how to be trans. I think that's coming. And I'm really excited because I already see it happening. And I'm really excited to see that. Excellent. Love it. I was uh, hanging out in California and I met a young woman um, and we were talking. And uh, anyways, really intense young woman kind of magical kind of coming in and out of like what I think of as grounded, but very, uh, very intelligent. Anyways, we started talking about gender for some reason. She said she was talking about how she had a crisis and she had to put herself in into uh, a medical, she had to go into a psychiatrist. What, what, what's it called when you, you like a psych hospital out? or yeah, a hospital, hospital something like she that. realized that none of the doctors had any idea what she was going through. They had, they had no idea how to, how to help her at all. Um, but she asked me then about, so we, we, we did the gender, the gender topic came up and she asked me and, you know, you always have to kind of fish out, you know, well, how do I say this in a way where the conversation can keep on going? And I said that, um, I kind of just said that I'm really concerned for the young women who, because they had sexual trauma or other kinds of despair are turning to gender to to work out their problems and then getting fast tracked onto medicalization and she totally a nice way of saying it she totally perked up she's like oh yeah i'm i i've been uh kind of a they them i'm just now coming back to being a she um because she had some very intense trauma uh and you know so i think i think uh, i i think that even us who are looking at this have no idea just how many young kids are thinking about this constantly and Mm -hmm. hopefully and i pray to god that Say sanity prevails, and I think that yeah, that get your medicine off my body or organo trans or some sort of you know, um, wow, that's a good one, natural right. trans because it's odd that, that the left <laughs> that the left shoved shoves all this nature stuff down our throats and puts GMO labels on our on every oh, one yeah. of our food items, and yet you know, putting synthetic hormones. I don't even know. Do you guys even know where the hormones come from? Do they just like take dead bodies and pull the testosterone? No, they're they're made. They're made in a lab. Okay, just from oh another book recommendation: Bob Ostertag, Science, Sex, oh, yeah. Self. 
He was on Lisa Selen Davis' Substack in her first ever interview, which was great. And we're actually having Bob on our program. Bob. It is a social history of testosterone, estrogen, and identity or something like that. Oh, wow. I think I'm getting the name wrong, but... I've got to read that. It's, you're, it's so good. I'm going to actually just order it now. Yeah. Do you ever like wonder what it would be like to just take testosterone for a month? Yeah, yes. al always. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, well I hear it's amazing. Yeah, yeah it I seems, hear it's pretty. <laughs> seems like it would be great. I don't think I would have to suffer much consequences if I just got like ten estrogen pills or something like that, and just like just rode the I remember, emotional I wave or something. Get when a little bit I of a period or whatever happens to. You. No. But I hear that you get a period if you take it. <laughs> I remember a, a trans woman who who had transitioned. She emailed me, and she'd emailed me, but she she you know she she kind of was quite reflective and about her own transition and thinking there was other roads I could have taken. Hmm. And she said, "We always you know say well let's say give them estrogen as in that was my solution, but maybe I should have been given testosterone." <laughs> you is, should actually in the book Bob me? talks about that because there what was. Yeah, he talks about how hormones were used to, quote, treat being gay. And so at first they thought if we give gay men testosterone, that will make them <laughs> less feminine. But actually it made them like ravenously right. horny. <laughs> um, and then they thought, <laughs> well, let's do it the other way around. I mean, they kept they basically kept inventing, uh, you know, conditions to try and treat with hormones in order okay. to pump people full of hormones. And there were, it's very interesting, but wow. that's, um, that's an interesting question from your, your the person who wrote into you, Stella. Yeah. I wonder She's if they had given me testosterone. She said, I was treated with estrogen, but maybe I should have been treated with, I was treated with estrogen and became mm -hmm. a woman. All these years later, maybe I should have been just treated with the testosterone and I would have become more, maybe, mm. habituated in my male mm. body. Or maybe not. Like, I, I'm always going to go towards the psychological model rather than the medical model. It just is not where I land generally. Yeah. 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 I, I don't want to pay, play God. And then because I think I'd have to pay God back at the end of my life. But that's just my own <laughs> theology. <laughs> Wrapping out. So I just have to say you guys are doing phenomenal work. And sorry, I called you guys now the third time, I think, in this episode. But <laughs> you wonderful women, uh, you two are just amazing and you're doing amazing work and Thanks. i want to give you guys kudos uh and oh so benjamin you're back. you're doing amazing yeah. work the, the work um, you've done with the detransitioners is is just extraordinary the detrans oh, and and by the way i mean you and i've talked about this off air but i really love the work you're doing with all the male detransitioners and trying to talk a little bit more about what's going on with them yeah and mm -hmm. i think we could spend hours yeah. more talking about that but yeah You've been doing some incredible videos with men who are really talking about the complex ways that the changing relationships between males and females and social media and maleness, like, wow, fascinating stuff. And I'm, I'm loving it. So, yeah. yeah, it's the one sub subgroup that gets into trouble with the radical feminists more than I do. So it's, it's nice to have compatriots. Well, Stella's and... been in trouble too, and so have I. <laughs> so we all oh, have. have you? <laughs> Thank oh, you very much. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Wait, what happened, Stella? Did I miss uh, this? Oh, you know. <laughs> okay, I'd have to remember. <laughs> I love the drama. It's so feminine. They're like gender critical, and then they act like a roving band of angry harpies. Sometimes, not all of them, not all of them. But there's no. What's I'm just a harpy? saying. This... Is that well, like a it's... sharpie? No, it's it's like it's, it's like a Greek myth. It's a, oh. like a gorgon or you know, like the the Dane, the Bacche, um, I guess. They roam the hills decapitating men. It's a oh. feminized slur. <laughs> okay. I didn't mean it as a slur, I just mean that it is kind oh, of Oh no, it's very funny, actually. <laughs> okay, wrapping it up there. Yeah, wrapping it up both. time. <laughs> Thank you so much Bye. for coming Thank out. You. Gender Thank and wider you. lens. Uh, listen Thanks, to it now. Benjamin. Oh, and and the parenting retreat. Could do you think oh, we could throw in a link about it? Oh, just let's wrap up where we where we began. Uh, tell us the oh. name of this retreat and when it's oh, going to yeah. happen. The wider lens renewal retreat happening at the end of October in Scottsdale, Arizona. 
you can find our event right by going to i think wider lens renewal retreat and if you google, google that yeah. you should be able to find it and we would love to see parents there in person give you guys in person hugs um and I yeah it's gonna be great this is in uh, sasha's home turf yeah. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see Sasha in her home turf. I've never seen, I've never been there. So and Stella's wait. never seen a cactus in person. So <laughs> I don't know. And all have... my life when I used to read, <laughs> you know, as a kid, Arizona, it was like, it felt like the most romantic word in the world, Arizona. So huh. I'm finally getting to go to Arizona. Well, you guys only really have nice. to, I guess Washington, D.C. and then New Orleans, you guys went to New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, we went to New Orleans together. It was super fun. I'm going to end up a Yank. <laughs> can't wait. I'll I convert can't you. Wait. <laughs>